Um, like to pivot now to our next panel. The impact of the pandemic on the aviation industry was one of the big stories of the past year. However, there is hope that the Biden administration will use federal policy to enable the industry to build back more sustainably here in the United States. The Atlanta Council Global Energy Center has worked on sustainable aviation for a number of years. And Tom Hicks, the former undersecretary of the Navy and founding principal and managing director at the Mabus Group has been involved in our work since day one. I'm delighted to welcome Tom back to the Global Energy Forum to moderate the panel, Decarbonization and the Future of US Aviation. Tom, how are you doing today? Really uh, glad to be here today. Thank you, Randy, my friend. Um, well, welcome everybody. Uh, very excited about this. We have a great panel here to talk about decarbonization and the future of US, US Aviation. Uh, we have Jeremy Baines. I was leaning back uh, a little bit and I lost. <laughs> lost. We have Jeremy Baines from, as the president of Nesty US. We have Mark Hammy, the vice president of corporate affairs and sustainability and the environment from Airbus. Uh, Jennifer Holmgren, uh, Holmgren is the CEO of Lanzatech, and Scott Kirby, the CEO of United Airlines. I mean, this is a quite a panel. Very excited to be here and to be uh, an honor to be amongst you. I think for the virtual audience out there, just uh, uh, for the way this will go format wise, uh, we'll have a couple questions, two or three questions that will go out to all of the panelists here. And then we'll follow up maybe with some specific ones. And we're gonna ask you all to provide your own questions to, uh, to the group as well. We're, we'll weave those in too. And so there's no, uh, no slides, uh, nothing of the sort and, and no opening statements. So thank you all uh, for being here. So why don't we get started? I'm, and I'm gonna go kind of in order. I'll probably have uh, Jennifer, then uh, Jeremy, Mark, and then Scott kind of uh, bat and clean up. The question I think is one we've all seen, one all have heard, and I think uh, Randy just kind of alluded to it. But certainly, uh, COVID-19 and the economics, economic impacts associated with COVID-19 um, has really had a, 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 a has been a, a tremendous challenge. What for you all, as it relates to decarbonizing sustainable aviation fuels, what uh, what has changed in your in the outlook in the near term and mid term uh, for sustainable avi aviation fuels and uh, your business models related to that, Jennifer? Yeah. So. Actually, interestingly, I think one of the things that the pandemic has done is it's made clear that when we come out of this, when we come out of the pandemic, aviation will need to be more sustainable. I think the signals are out there that as we come out of this, we're going to have to be more conscious of sustainability. Um, I haven't seen any tremendous change in the business model. It's interesting. We launched Lanzajet this year and we closed it in what I like to call, sorry, Aviation Armageddon. And mm -hmm. despite that, we were able to build a company whose future was all about sustainable aviation fuel because of the belief that sustainable aviation fuel is critically important to the industry and the future of the industry. Great. Thank you, uh, Jennifer. Jeremy, what's your take on uh, the impact of of COVID? Well, I would say that uh, it's maybe similar to what Jennifer has been saying. Um, and once, once we get out of this, I want to start flying again, to start seeing my, my family, uh, discussing early on with, in, in the break with Scott that uh, business will, will start blossoming again. But I think there's also an awareness that we want to do it more sustainably than in the past. Uh, and if we look at it in the context of uh, climate change, uh, we need to stop burning fossil fuels. So what are the solutions available today to make it more sustainable? And what are the solutions in the future to continue um, being able to fly? So now is, now is really the opportunity. How are we going to go about doing this for the next couple of decades? Yeah, that's great. It's such a great point. I mean, I think when you look at the aviation industry at their core, it's not about transportation in my mind, it's about connecting people. And just to that point, I mean, I look forward to the day when we can connect not only this way, but also in, in, in a real way. And I think that's the power of the aviation industry. Um, so Mark, what's your take on, on this topic? Yes, thank you very much. Very happy to be with you this afternoon. Um, we are meeting at a very critical moment for this industry. Uh, first, of course, the COVID uh, crisis is the most impacting the most severe crisis for aviation forever. 
And at the same time, we can see an increasing pressure coming from uh, climate change on our business, on our activity, on aviation. So we absolutely need to recover from this crisis in aviation. At the same time, we'll have to manage uh, the most important transition in our history of our sector for a fully uh, decarbonized aviation. Of course, first objective is to recover for, from the crisis. Uh, the impact is huge. Uh, I think that Scott will say that first on airlines, but also on airports, on air navigation uh, services, and on the whole uh, manufacturing uh, industry and supply chain. At Airbus, we had to reduce our production by 40%. Uh, finally, we deliver 566 aircraft this year, which is 34% uh, less than uh, last year. So according to the plan, I have to say that we have been able to manage hand-to-hand -hand with the customers this crisis, and we are very thankful to them. We are also very grateful for the support of the government. But today, this industry is really in a very fragile situation. So we need to recover. This is not only for aviation industry. Uh, as you said, uh, aviation is very important for the recovery of the global economy. Uh, you know, it's very important for trade, for tourism. I think in, in the USA, uh, um, if you count all the jobs supported uh, by the aviation industry, the tourism and so on, it's close to 10 million jobs. And it's 1.8 trillion of GDP. So it's very important for the, for the economy, but it's very important also for the society. As you said, it's first about connected people, uh, and after this long lockdown, I think it, it's, it's very important to restart the exchange between states and between people. And this is really vital for the stability and peace in the world. And so we, we do think that there is a need for aviation and there is, will be a rebound for, for air transport after the COVID crisis. We, we need that and we, we trust it will happen, even if it could take some time, some, even some years. Uh, but of course, what we are expecting now is a vaccination campaign can uh, reduce the pandemic and uh, we can uh, restart to travel again. Great. Thank you, Mark. So, Scott, uh, what's your take? I mean, you're, you're you know, major airline. Um, it's been, you know, 2020 has been like every other year, right? I wish. Um, look, th thanks for hosting me, uh, Tom, uh, and the Atlantic Council. And I'll piggyback on what you said, because what we were fond of saying before, or fond of saying today, and will be in the future, is that we're about uniting people and connecting the world. Uh, I believe firmly that we are social creatures and that we will get back to uniting people and connecting the world. But as Jennifer said, this has been aviation Armageddon. Uh, we never contemplated anything like this, even in our worst case planning scenarios. After 9-11, revenues were down 40% for two months. And then within 12 months, we're kind of back to down 10%. Uh, we're still down 70%, um, you know, 10 months into this crisis. Um, at United, uh, we've been in the last quarter burning $35 million a day in cash. Uh, that sounds horrific, um, and it is. Uh, but when this started back in March, it was $100 million a day. Um, just remarkable numbers to think about. And that's been catastrophic um, for airlines, for our employees, uh, but as Mark alluded to, also for economies around the world. Um, you know, I don't, there wasn't, I'm not sure, an appreciation for how many jobs and good paying jobs the aviation industry drives, not just directly within in, in aviation, but if you go to Orlando or Las Vegas or the convention center in San Diego or anywhere, uh, the number of jobs that are driven um, by connecting people and uniting the world. I think the governments around the world, but particularly here in the U.S., for the support, um, the industry would have been devastated uh, without support. Government support not only helped us, um, it gave us the time to go raise money in the private capital markets um, to make it through the crisis. And, and while we're going to make it through the crisis, uh, aviation will be changed forever. And one of the perhaps counterintuitive conclusions that I've reached, at least, that relates to what we're talking about today is that sustainability has become more important than ever. Um, and that's more clear now than it was before. And the reason is because there's no way anyone can tell you with a straight face that we are not part of a global community and everything that happens everywhere in the globe is connected to everywhere else. Uh, and decarbonization is at the top of the list. Um, it's something I've cared passionately about for many, many year, decades. 
Uh, and I think that's more clear than ever. And so the commitment that we make, not just in aviation, but in the world uh, to decarbonizing is going to be critical. United, we're proud of our leadership role. Um, coming into the pandemic, we represented over 50% of commercial aviation's worldwide commitments to purchasing avi sustainable aviation fuel. Um, and we just, despite everything that's going on in the pandemic, uh, about a month ago, announced that we're participating in the world's largest direct air capture and sequestration, a carbon sequestration program partnership with Occidental uh, and 1.5. Uh, we'll talk about this, I'm sure. But at least I'm convinced there's no way we're going to decarbonize the planet <laughs> without that, unless unless all of a sudden fusion power becomes real. Um, but absent that, <laughs> we're going to have to have sequestration. Well, I, I, we'll definitely come back to that, Scott. Uh, I, I think that's a uh, very great uh, and interesting announcement by you all. Uh, I think I'm going to stay with you, uh, and I'll, I'll kind of work back uh, with this next question. And it's, uh, we are less than 24 hours away from having a new administration. Um, if you had your way from where you sit in your industry, uh, what are what policy changes or what would you want to see? What one or two or three policy changes would you want to see yeah. uh, to grow <coughs> and to allow for decarbonization and to increase sustainable aviation fuel demand? So we'll yeah. start with you, Scott, and then we'll, I'll work to to Mark. And Mark, for you, I know we're, we, you're kind of based in Europe. We're going to ask you to kind of take those lessons learned and 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 tell us Americans what we should be doing. So, but first, we'll go to Scott. So first, I'm gonna answer this question as a citizen of the world instead of the CEO of United Airlines, uh, because those might be different things. Um, although, since I am the CEO, I can choose to answer them uh, in the same way. Um, and first, I think somewhere, uh, and I've, I've spoken to a lot of people in the new administration, um, we need a way to put a price on carbon. Um, we're not gonna solve this unless we put a price on carbon. Um, and we're gonna need government, both carrots and sticks to do that. Um, and you can't do it overnight, um, but you can do it gradually. So I think a price on carbon um, is important. And I think support for um, sequestration, other credit mechanisms, um, the only one that I know of that's truly scalable at this point um, is sequestration. Uh, so government support for those that you can build the economies of scale, drive the cost down. You know, I'm fond of talking about sequestration as an example for 20 or 30 years ago, everyone said solar and wind power were uneconomic, uh, but today they can compete. Um, and that's because as you invest and as you drive economies of scale and efficiencies, you can make those more efficient. Um, but we're gonna need government support to do those things uh, in the near term and, and probably some kind of credits uh, that allow you to do that. Uh, on a more tactical airline basis, uh, one of my incredible frustrations um, for years has been the inefficient air traffic control system that we have today. Uh, we estimate that we could improve um, efficiency by 15% by just using essentially GPS technology to fly instead of flying the highways in the sky that we fly today. Yeah. Um, and that cuts the time for customers that you're on the airplane, um, makes the aircraft more efficient, cuts emissions by 15%. It is a win, win, win across the board. Um, but we've been unable to get much progress done. Uh, so in the short, short term, the lowest hanging fruit is to just modernize the air traffic control um, system. And in the longer term, a price on carbon and, and support for industries that are decarbonizing, I, I think is gonna be great. That's great. And and for for our virtual audience out there, don't forget to, to put your questions in. We'll, we'll, we'll surely be able to get to those as we can. And I love the idea, Scott, about talking about carrots and sticks as somebody who has a market transformation background in my past, uh, big believer in both of those things is kind of ways to help motivate and uh, move industries. Uh, we can talk about more about that later. So Mark, you know, I know your perspective is probably based on Europe, but maybe there's some good lessons learned, good advice you could give us as we think about and, and as we kind of go into this next, uh, this new administration that begins tomorrow. So what, what, what are some thoughts uh, that you might have for us? Thank you. No, no, no lesson from me or from Airbus, but what do we believe? Uh, at Airbus, we, we, we do believe that uh, carbon neutral aviation is possible and we can achieve, achieve it in a lifetime. And I think that this vision is largely shared within this industry. Well, what I just said demonstrates this. And if you look at the, you know, ECAG report, 
So this association of grouping all the uh, industry, airlines, manufacturers, airports, they deliver a very interesting report, Waypoint 2050, showing a, a trajectory, a global trajectory for aviation with uh, 50 less emission in, in 2050 and the carbon, carbon neutral aviation in 2060 uh, without offsetting. And uh, we do support this trajectory. And uh, at Airbus, of course, we can see that on, on, on short term, uh, already updating the, the, the fleets with the last generation of aircraft can reduce the emission by 20 to 25 percent, which is already a step. Of course, sustainable aviation fuel or aircraft are certified for 50 percent incorporation of sustainable aviation fuel, which means something like 40 percent less emission. And we are working on a, uh, 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 a potential 100% incorporation of sustainable aviation fuel in the future, better uh, your operation, better air navigation services. And to go a step further, uh, we have the ambition of being the, the, the first manufacturer to deliver a zero emission aircraft to the horizon 2035. Uh, we are working uh, on three concepts, projects. Uh, a turboprop uh, with hydrogen uh, burn in a gas turbine uh, with a range of uh, 1,000 nautical miles and a capacity of uh, 100 seats or so. A turbofan uh, with a capacity that could go between 120 or 200 and a range of 2,000 nautical miles. And uh, a blading with body, so a very innovative concept that, that could offer more uh, flexibility for the storage of, of hydrogen. Why do we look at hydrogen? Uh, because uh, a lot of other sectors, uh, including in transport, and buses, cars, or trucks, or ships, or vessels are looking for this. You know that we... Uh, if hydrogen is produced for a renewable or a very low carbon electricity, it can be uh, fully decarbonized, carbon neutral. It can be burned in, in a gas turbine. It can be uh, used uh, to produce electricity for sales. Uh, and it can also uh, uh, be associated to uh, carbon capture to deliver uh, what you call e-fuels, uh, um, P2L, uh, power to liquid, so uh, synthetic fuels that could fly on our aircraft and also deliver a very low uh, carbon footprint for, for, for aviation. So, so we do believe that, that there are solutions in short term, medium term, long term to, to decarbonize. And, and this is something that we, we would like to deliver with all uh, the stakeholders in aviation uh, so that the next generation can continue to fly as we do today in perfect respect of the environment. That's great. Thank you, Mark. And, and Jeremy, you know, uh, you all have, uh, Nesty has two of the largest, if not more, of the largest refineries, alternative fuel refineries in the world. Rumor has it, uh, you may be thinking and looking at the U.S., but what's your perspective in terms of this question? What would you like to see from this administration? to kind of incentivize and grow that demand for sustainable aviation fuel? Um, thank you. I mean, firstly, I don't think there's a magic bullet to this. There's no, there's no one single solution that is going to make flying more sustainable. And I, th um, I think we need, to find, we need to use all the available solutions out there. Um, CCS can be one of them. Uh, but at the end of the day, we need to stop burning fossil fuels in planes. And it's, it's great that, uh, that we have technology on the horizon, but there are tens of thousands of planes in, in the air today, or they should be in the air today, or will be back in the air very shortly. And we are producing hundreds of new planes per day. So for decades to come, the technology of choice will be to burn some kind of fuel. And therefore, we have to ask ourselves, what do we want to burn? And sustainable aviation fuel is a fuel that is available today. It is uh, still a niche market, but really scaling up rapidly. Um, that actually tackles a lot of these questions. I mean, it does reduce emissions by 80%, and it works without changing any infrastructure. So I think 
having in place the policies that um, encourage using solutions that work today, while also recognizing that there might be uh, solutions in the future is so important. So this admin, the new administration, when it comes in, could quite clearly make that choice. And, and maybe even in the, uh, to be able to support the aviation industry, come with um, a direct support for promoting sustainable aviation fuels to the airlines so that the industry can recover faster. I th so I think th those, are, those are things that, uh, that in, an incoming administration could directly do. That's great. Thank you, Jeremy. So, so Jennifer, you've worked with past administrations and, and, and agencies within those to good effect. I'm sure there's been a little bit of frustration from time to time in working with some of those. But what is, from your perspective uh, at Lands Attack, what would you like to see? What are the one or two, three things you'd like to see from uh, uh, this new administration uh, as it relates to your sector? Yeah, so, so I would say that it's extremely important to have incentives that enable the production of sustainable aviation fuel. And those incentives need to help develop those fuels as they relate also to ground transportation. There needs to be an incremental incentive to enable them to go into the aviation sector rather than the easier to access uh, road transport. So I see the, the government will need to put some incentives in place. The second thing I see, and I think it's important for us to think about industry and how it will grow. So bigger, bigger, bigger is better, right? That's because petroleum is the densest liquid on earth, right? And so you can move it to a central location and build a 200,000 barrel a day facility. We're talking about waste resources. You cannot aggregate waste resources. You're not gonna move biomass to a central location. You're not to a large central location. MSW, we use waste gases. You're not gonna aggregate waste gases. So what I imagine is a distributed approach to the production of sustainable aviation fuels. That doesn't exist today. The ability to make small modules, the ability to 3D print at a remote location, all these things, the only way you make that happen is if you build more. You build a lot of things. And as every technology evolves, it's an exponential growth and it goes exponentially down the cost curve as well. So the governments need to help us replicate. They need to help us really get across the value of death, build the first one, build the second one, build the fourth one, and then this will take off. And so project finance and enabling project finance, whether that be direct grants or loan guarantees or other such things that enable us to build enough of these plants to get them down the cost curve is the second really important factor. And I think when we do that, we'll get to the same place solar has, right? 10 years ago, we were screaming about Solyndra and laughing about solar was never gonna be anything. And here we are. That is what happens with new technology and we need to get sustainable aviation fuel to that point. And that's what I think government needs to help us do. So maybe a follow-up and this point maybe also applies to, to Jeremy is you, you mentioned feedstocks, uh, a, a critical part to this, but can it, if you could just talk to us about uh, obviously, you're looking at industrial waste uh, gases, but I also think as you've gone into lands of jet, you're also looking at some other uh, waste opportunities. And so that that question, but then to 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 Jeremy, you know, you all have made a very kind of public and notable transition uh, uh, to kind of waste feedstocks. But what do you all see as the the now solution uh, in your your respective companies and in industry? And what do you what do you see on the horizon in terms of uh, availability of feedstocks? Yeah, so um, what I what I see so so for for those that don't know, we use gases. We convert gases, so it can be industrial waste gases, uh, carbon monoxide, hydrogen, carbon dioxide, gasified municipal solid waste, um, gasified biomass. We can also take direct air capture and with electrolysis convert that. So the box is big. And so you see a sequence of technologies. And the way I see the sequence is, I talk about putting steel in the ground. How many boxes of steel do you have to put in the ground to make the aviation fuel? 
Okay. If it's industrial waste gas, I just go directly and convert it. If I have to put a gasifier, I add costs. If I add an electrolyzer to add more hydrogen, I add costs. That's how I think about it. So that's how I think about the sequencing of the feedstocks. How many boxes do I have to put in place to make the, the fuel? I believe that there is plenty a feedstock. My old job was all heifer based, right? Oils, waste oils. That's the technology we developed. And there is a limit to that. But once you start getting into waste, solid waste, uh, mixed waste, there's no stopping you. So feedstock will not be the problem. You said about Lancet I talked about Lancet Tech and the feedstocks we use, but for Lancet we can use any ethanol. And there, what I imagine is a more sustainable ethanol where the ethanol producer partners with the agriculture company and we start to work on as you create a lower CI ethanol, the farmer also gets some credit. If they have better agriculture practice, they get credit. If they get um, different lower carbon fertilizers, they get credit. So I see a partnership between the producers and the farmers creating a lower CI product by figuring out how to make the feedstock production more sustainable. There is so much room. This is sky's the limit, no pun intended. Yeah. I like that. So uh, uh, Jeremy, uh, I'm gonna add to this question because we, we got some uh, question along the way from one of our uh, members from the virtual audience, Chris Midgley. And I think it relates to you all and this question of feedstocks. So if you could just kind of answer that question, but also you know, the, the question we got from Chris is uh, essentially, is, is there enough tallow, for example, to scale? Uh, I think it's a, it's a fair question. I know uh, you all are involved in your, your plant in Singapore, looking at Australia and, and the tallow market there. But from your perspective, what are the feedstocks of today? Can they scale? And what other feedstocks might, you see, might we see in the future? Uh, I, I agree with Jennifer. Feedstock is not the issue. Yeah. Um, today, Neste users use cooking oil that, for example, we collect from the airports. Yeah, so we, we use the used cooking oil from the airports and can convert them into fuels. Uh, but we're also looking to move into algae. We can use municipal solid waste, uh, the, the gases that come off it. We can also use forestry waste. Um, so I, th I, I really think that if, if, there, if the policy direction were to have like a direct support for aviation fuel, like a blender's tax credit for SAF, you would really start seeing the demand pick up and the supply would come online to match it. Yeah, so for, for the foreseeable future, I don't see a challenge with the, with the amount of feedstock. Um, and I don't think we can look at feedstock at one feedstock at a time, uh, a used cooking oil or a tallow or whatever. It's the pool of available feedstocks out there. There is a lot available. And, and then I think we, we also talked uh, briefly about uh, carbon credits earlier. Um, I, I think what, what, what you see is that each industry has a different value on carbon um, because it's, it's so much more difficult to decarbonize aviation than it is my passenger vehicle. Yeah? So um, the passenger vehicle will very likely go electric first and that will free up feedstocks for the harder to, to abate industries like the aviation sector. So, so I, I, I think there's the feedstock element but then there's also how do you tackle these different sectors of the economy and, and make sure that there's a support there, like Jennifer said, to build those boxes yeah, so that you get that scale necessary. That's great. So I want to uh, change things and, and, and get over to Scott here for a second. So Scott, United Airlines uh, recently announced it was taking the, the very bold, very ambitious step of pledging to reduce its GHG emissions 100% by 2050. I'd like to see if you just kind of tell us about that. Why was now the right time for United to make this commitment? And tell us how you plan to make that, uh, meet that, that goal. Uh, I'm assuming that's through sustainable aviation fuels as well as uh, you know, some of your more recent announcements on direct air capture, but maybe you can just talk a little bit about both of those. Yeah, so um, the timing uh, was, it was really uh, about, um, and I don't mean, I apologize if this sounds egotistical, uh, but this is something I've wanted to do for my, uh, for as long in my career as I can remember. Um, I've been interested in um, the environment, believed that global warming was happening since the 1980s um, and have always wanted to make a difference. And uh, sometimes you've got to be the CEO to make a decision like this. 
Um, and so I became the CEO, and that, that truly is um, what the timing was. And what we tried to do was something unique um, and different than I know of any large corporation has done, which is when we said 100% green, uh, we met 100% green without using traditional carbon offset programs. And one of the frustrations to me is that there's a lot of people in the world that are talking about and that care uh, about climate change, um, but they take the easy way out, which is writing a check for a traditional carbon offset program. Um, and the truth is most of those, many of those, not maybe not most, but many of those aren't even real. Um, you know, it's paying somebody to not cut down trees that were never gonna be cut down. Uh, but even if they are real, um, you know, man-made emissions are up 4,000 times since the industrial era began. We cannot plant 4,000 times as many trees. Um, it just won't work. Um, and if you're good at math, you know that the traditional carbon offset program won't work. Um, and I don't think personally, and I've been following this for a long time, again, I sort of said it tongue in cheek, but absent, you know, a breakthrough in fusion energy, it's really hard for me to do the math that you don't have to wind up with, to, with some kind of carbon sequestration as a big part of the answer. Um, and so we wanted to, more than anything, not just talk about what we're doing at United, we want to change the conversation um, and make the conversation about real solutions that will really make a difference. Um, and that's why we focused on this partnership with Occidental and 1.5 uh, to, to move towards sequestration. I recognize it's not economic today, uh, but as both Jeremy and Jennifer talked about, you got to come down exponentially on those cost curves. Um, and so we just wanted to start and we wanted to change the conversation more than just the commitment at United. Um, and, um, and hope that, we, that if we can be a part of getting the pebble rolling down the hill, it can become, it can become an avalanche um, and, and actually change the conversation that leads to real difference um, and meaningful change in the world. That's great. Scott, I'm gonna follow up with you on this and, and something that I, I kind of can relate to my time back in the Pentagon when we were going through the same uh, iterations, you know, buying more aircraft, you knew you were gonna, when you bought those aircraft, they were gonna be in, uh, in operations for you know, three decades or more. Um, and so meaning that you're going to be in the liquid fuel business of some kind for quite a while, which is why we really went after all uh, sustainable aviation fuels or biofuels as we call them then. Um, so I, I guess a question for you, and I'll, I, this may apply to the other, other panelists as well, but, you know, uh, we're starting to see, um, you know, this uh, kind of uh, the, the focus from the electrification of the ground transportation. And now you're starting to see these very nascent uh, things looking at aviation. What, where do you see that? How are you tracking that? Is that something you see in the 2030s, 2040s, where, uh, or somewhere beyond? Is that something that's going to you know, necessarily be limited to things like short haul flights? Uh, just how is, how is it you, you all look yep. at the issue? So the problem is energy density. Um, and you know, um, in the energy density of jet fuel is triple that of hydrogen. Um, even if you could create green hydrogen, um, it requires a lot of energy for electrolysis to create green hydrogen. Um, it's one third the density of uh, jet fuel. Um, and so for long haul aviation uh, and, and batteries require a technology that's not on even anyone's theoretical drawing board to ever have, have the energy density to power an aircraft um, on long haul flights. I think there's probably going to be opportunities for small and short haul um, aircraft but for the bulk of what we do flying long haul, we're not gonna be able to fly um, an airplane from San Francisco to Bangalore with 300 people on board uh, with hydrogen or um, batteries, unless there's some change in technology and that is not even on anyone's theoretical drawing board. It's farther out than fusion energy. <laughs> um, so I think we're gonna be flying airplanes for a long time, which is finding other things, which means finding other things to do to decarbonize this industry. Yeah, so so it's kind of a similar question to Mark at Airbus. I know you you all notably about ten years or so ago started looking at this, started doing some groundwork in in electric and hybrid electric propulsion. Uh, where do you see things in that regard? And same kind of question in the twenty thirties, twenty forties. Is it is that um, you know is the potential there? Maybe to answer Scott's uh, 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 Respond, respond to Scott's uh, view that yeah we need some technological innovations that don't yet exist. So what, what's your what's your thinking on that? What Scott has said is is of course uh, exact. Uh, so which means that with the status of the batteries today, it's difficult to imagine an aircraft flying with only batteries, except for uh, little aircraft on on short haul. 
Uh, and this is why we are turning now to, to hydrogen. This is true also that, uh, as I said, for the time being, we can imagine a range of 2,000 nautical miles, so, which is already that uh, significant segment of the uh, aviation sector. But uh, probably for long haul aircraft, uh, we will to further develop a technology to be able to, to replace <laughs> fuel. And this is why uh, the development of sustainable aviation fuel or power to liquid fuel, electronic fuel is important for this segment because it, it's possible to fly with these fuels already on existing aircraft and for long. And but for long haul aircraft, uh, this is solution. But we really want to explore the solution of hydrogen for short, medium all aircraft and see if we can extend it to a longer range uh, aircraft in the future. And, and so this is why we have decided to, to develop our studies on this segment, um, because we think that this is something to explore that is very interesting. You know, in the past, uh, the energy sector was dominated by oil and, and even the, 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 the global economy. It's possible that in the future, Hydrogen will be dominant. If we look at the, at the plan developed by many, many countries, including the USA, uh, we can see uh, that hydrogen could have a very large part of the energy production or transport in, in the near future. And uh, I think we cannot miss this opportunity to have aviation included in these plans. And so this is why we really want to explore this. We are an innovative company and see what are the right uh, modules and can fly with this technology. And as it was said, uh, I think by Jeremy, there is no one solution. Uh, so uh, probably the different models, the different aircraft with different range will fly with different solutions, perhaps electrical aircraft for, for little range and small models, general aviation, uh, hydrogen hybrid aircraft for, for short medium range and, and uh, electronic fuel or sustainable aviation fuel for, for long range in the medium term. And then we'll see what, what happens in the longer term. Great. So I, I've got a question. This is you know based on some what we were looking at to some degree during our time in the Pentagon. But this is really, I think, primarily for Mark and maybe Scott, uh, and but, it, but any of the panelists. But as, you, as we look at the performance characteristics of the aircraft using sustainable aviation fuel, is there enough research out there? Is there a compelling case that shows uh, either efficiency gains from that, uh, in addition to the obviously the, the great environmental gains we're getting from that, and, and GHG reductions? Um, and then also, is is the research sufficient as it relates to um, the um, uh, the the life of the engine, for example? Uh, I know the things that Airbus puts in its airplanes are you know engines coming from other vendors and United is flying those, you know, fl flying airplanes that come from those vendors as well. But what's the state of the research? Is this a, an area that uh, could use some federal support here? So I'll, I'll turn that over to Scott first and then, sure. and then back to Mark. Uh, well, to the best of my knowledge, um, I'm quite comfortable putting sustainable aviation fuel in the engines and that it's not going to impact um, and everything that I've seen says it's not going to impact the long term. Yeah, sure. I was thinking of a positive impact, actually, where where you have fewer particulates in the in the fuel that may yeah. speak to a, a longer life. But you're I'm not aware of anything that's a, a positive outcome beyond the environmental benefits, which are substantial and which you know right. are obviously the reason to do it. Um, but I at least maybe Mark can correct me if this is wrong. Think of it as equivalent to running uh, an airplane with jet fuel and no substantial difference one way or the other. Yeah. Mark, any, any Yes, comments? I can confirm. Um, so from the time being, we have a limitation to 50% blend. So uh, we have to explore. And there is obviously no, no issue, a very good uh, fuel efficiency with this sustainable aviation fuel up to 50%. And uh, now we have to explore uh, if we can go further, up to 100%. We think that should be possible. And uh, we cannot see from the time being uh, real difficulties, even if there could be some adaptation. It's not exactly the same fuel. And you know that uh, there are different pathways, so we have to study the different fuels. There is another thing we have to explore, which is the non-CO2 uh, impact. 
and uh, how uh, sustainable aviation fuel can also reduce the non-CO2 effects of, uh, of aviation. And this is a domain that needs a further scientific studies, but this would be very interesting uh, to look at this. And here again, we can even see benefit uh, from, from sustainable aviation fuel. We do hope that it will also reduce uh, the non-CO2 impact of aviation. So uh, a lot of hope on, on the use of sustainable aviation fuel. For us, it's really to go from 50% to 100% that will allow to really reduce uh, the, the CO2 impact of aviation. Yeah. Great, thanks, Mark. So Jennifer, you feel free to comment on that last question, but also you mentioned before, or maybe I brought it up first, but you, know, you, you all have had a, a pretty busy year, pretty busy six months, uh, even though we've been in this Armageddon, as you said. Um, but curious, you know, what is Lanza Jet that you've, you've, you've created? What is that allowing you to do that you couldn't do as Lanza Tech? And if you just talk to us a little bit about, you know, kind of why that was the right move to make uh, um, last year and, and what do you see going forward for Lanza Jet? Thanks, Tom. Um, I, let me address the, the emissions issue because when I think about sustainable aviation fuels, I don't just think about greenhouse gas reductions. These fuels don't have sulfur. Particulates are significantly less. We did quite a bit of work with NRC in Canada showing no contrails. Uh, well, a big reduction in contrails, I shouldn't say no. These things are really, really important. If you live near an airport, they're really important. And so they augment the social justice issue um, and these things are available now. These benefits are available now. I always think of sustainable aviation fuel as not a blending component, but an uplifting component to conventional kerosene. And I think that's a, a factor we miss. Um, going back to why we formed LanzaJet, so it would have been just easy to keep LanzaJet inside LanzaTech. But apart from the fact it's a very different technology, I really feel that one, we have to bend the curve very quickly, right? We can't just be looking at all of these things that are long-term and not bend the curve now. The longer it takes to bend the curve, the harder it is going to be to have a real impact. And I think sustainable aviation fuel is a key way to bend the carbon curve and a key way to do something in the aviation industry now. And so what I wanted to do is we've already demonstrated, we've already flown a flight with Virgin Atlantic. We had a delivery flight with ANA. What I wanted to do is build a 10 million gallon a year plant to produce SAF as quickly as possible. And I felt that by creating an organization outside of Lancet Tech, that it was his own organization, it could do that. The second thing I did was that we took investment a little different. There are lots of people who are willing to invest to help us build our first demo, but that wasn't good enough. What I wanted were investors that were committed to the first plan and to building the first commercial. If the KPIs were met, they would go ahead and invest in an SPV in a local jurisdiction that they had. But in addition, they were going to do the development of the plant, the environmental permits, all of the things that take two to three years in parallel with us building that demo, that 10 million gallon a year plant. So by putting all of that in an organization, we were able to create much more momentum than if this was just a part of Lancetec. I also wanted Lancetec to access other ethanols. Uh, we're not the only ones that produce sustainable ethanol and I wanted to give them that opportunity because creating that market, right? You start to pull other technologies also on the feedstock side. So that's why we did that. We want to go fast. We want to go really, really fast. And I've been building plants, as you know, uh, for a long, long time. And I figured, you know, leverage that knowledge to figure out how to go faster, faster, faster. Yeah, that's great. So, Jeremy, a uh, question for you. And, you know, um, I, I guess, you know, kind of coming back to where we were, just any other policy things that you would like to see? Uh, to get sustainable aviation fuel to take off, uh, no pun intended. But wh what else do you see, whether it's from the government, the federal government, local? Uh, and I'm curious if you have any thoughts about the role of airports and airport authorities. Um, obviously, we've got a great cross-section of folks here representing the industry. Um, you know, the, the, the airports is, to kind of Jennifer's point, is where, you know, um, you know that see a lot of those uh, emissions 
kind of firsthand. And I'm just curious if you have any thoughts about what they could do in terms of carrots and sticks and infrastructure that would support you and your industry. Yeah, well, I think first, I think it's also still important to recognize the, the efforts that the airlines and the airplane manufacturers have been making in making flying more sustainable over the years. And, and companies like, uh, like United have been at the forefront of this for a long time. So it's also listening to what all the partners in this ecosystem want. What, what do the, what do the communities want that are near the airports? What, what is needed by the airlines to make it more sustainable? So there are many policies that, that can help in that, in that regard. Um, I think Scott mentioned, uh, carrots and sticks. Yeah. Uh, so, so what, what are the, what are the, the, the carrots like, um, like, um, um, SAF blenders tax credit that uh, that can reduce the price on the one hand, and what is the one that makes the the playing field more equal for everyone? So is there is there a need to either put a price on carbon or to put a um, an, an amount of volume that needs to be incorporated? So I think there are many different policy uh, choices out there that uh, that can that can be followed, um, but it's really finding something that most people feel will really help. Um, to, to, to tackle this problem. And, and I think maybe also to, to, to the earlier discussion about, um, about SAF, uh, the first thing that springs to mind is safety of the fuel for all the, for, for the planes and the passengers that go on it. The second thing that we'll focus then is then the sustainability of the fuel. Uh, this, this overnight reduces greenhouse gas emissions by up to 80%. But then also think about the difference in the production we produce these at a facility which is dedicated to making sustainable fuels as opposed to the emissions that come off an oil or petroleum refinery. So in terms of the, the local emissions in the communities, this makes a big difference as well. And so I think there are many aspects to this problem. So Scott, uh, maybe to you about this question about uh, airports and airport authorities. I know, is this a question of where the airports and can lead the way or is it going to take um, somebody like you and, and, and United to, 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 to help move them uh, along is uh, where, where do you see what, where do you see the role of, uh, of airports in this equation? I, I think that airports will be broadly very supportive, um, but likely supportive in the sense that it's because the airlines are uh, asking them to do something. Um, you know, the hurdles are, are on our side and on, on people like Jennifer and Jeremy that are creating the same sustainable aviation fuels. Um, you know, to the best of my knowledge, we would use the same infrastructure to get it there that we already have today. Um, and because of that, the, the airports will be supportive of anything that we ask them to do, uh, but are, are probably not the, the right constituent to try to, to lead the effort. It'd be hard for them to lead the effort um, yeah. as opposed to getting airlines to, to lead it with partnerships with, with the, the people that are producing actual SAF. Well, I've got a question for you from a former uh, United employee and a good friend or old friend of mine from the, the days uh, um, uh, when I was in the Pentagon uh, and he was at United, uh, Jimmy Smartsis, who's now yeah. CEO of uh, Lanza Jet, uh, bringing everything full circle. But Hi, Jimmy. <laughs> for, for the group, um, what guidance do you have? So we'll go in order. We'll start, start with you, Scott. Um, what guidance do you have for others to help overcome break down barriers and enable progress? Um, look, I think we have to ha have honest conversations. Um, and honest conversations means not papering over the problem, but as an example, with traditional carbon offsets. Uh, it means accepting that we're going to need uh, government support and credits to bend the, the cost curve um, on these things. And it probably means that even when we bend the cost curve, some of these are going to um, to be more expensive and that's an appropriate price to pay. Um, it's the same as putting a price on carbon. Um, that, you know, we can't have everything in a consumer society that we've had in the past and expect it to cost the same. Um, this is gonna cost something to deal with the problem. But I think more than anything, um, we need to ha start having honest conversations about what real solutions are. This doesn't just apply to aviation, sustainable aviation fuels. Um, it applies to decarbonizing the whole economy um, and arresting uh, the increase in global temperatures. Um, without honest conversations, we're never going to get to the real answers. That's great. So, Mark, with Airbus, what what you know, same similar question. I mean, same question. I'll just phrase it a different way. What's the for you and for Airbus? What's the most important factor 
um, that you would attribute your, your Airbus's success in, in your decarbonization efforts? Uh, as we said at the very beginning, uh, there is a need for uh, partnership and leadership from both the industry and, and, and the administration and governments. Um, this is a really a very important transition and we need to work all together on, on that topic. Uh, of course, at Airbus, uh, we are first dedicated to uh, work on, on new technologies for both hydrogen aircraft, but also even for sustainable aviation fuel, we need to develop aircraft that can accept 100% uh, sustainable aviation fuel blend. And so uh, this is where we are developing our, our, our activities, but really we need to work together in partnership between the government and the industry. It's good to see, uh, as we can see today, some airlines and some uh, producers of sustainable aviation taking the lead. Of course, we also want to, to take the lead on, on the technology side of this industry and all together put the different solutions to achieve a, a, a fully decarbonized aviation uh, in the horizon 2050-2060. And so this is very important to, to work hand in hand. And of course, in this, uh, we need also the support of the states to incentivize this transition. I think the uh, Atlantic Council has made an excellent report in April last year on the different options to incentivize. But I think we need also signal uh, from the state they want to go in this direction and they want to support the industries going in, 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 in this direction. So in good partnership, developing, supporting the development of technology on one side, developing the, 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 the development of the production of special aviation on the other side and for their own also uh, developing a better uh, traffic management. Uh, there is a lot already achieved in the US mm -hmm. with next gen and so on, but I think this is an area also for future development. That's great, thank you. So, so Jeremy, I want you to take this question. What's that most important factor for Nesty? But I also, I think, you know, Nesty's journey here has been really interesting and admirable. You've been at Nesty for, for many, many years. I wonder if you could also, in addition to what's that most important factor, but maybe talk about that transition from the feedstocks that you used to use to those that you're focusing on now. I mean, what was that transformation like in the in 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 the company? Um, yep, over to you. Yeah, I've um, I've had the pleasure of working for Neste for for nearly twenty years, and um, and when I think when I first heard about renewable fuels within Neste, I was skeptical. Um, but uh, and and I was skeptical because I didn't quite understand it. But as as you as you learn more and more about it, you, you realize that actually this is this is a solution that makes sense. Um, it uses the infrastructure and technology available. Um, yes, you start off with uh, the easier oils to use, the vegetable oils that are out there. And as as you learn, you you, you use um, more and more difficult uh, oils. And by that, I mean you go into wastes and residues. And then you start exploring how can you use algae and usable solid waste? How can you use forestry waste? So actually, then you very rapidly discover that, hey, this solution is really scalable and it works uh, and it works overnight. And um, you've you've got you've got stuff that that works today, and then you've got a you've got a, a roadmap for how do you make this pool broader and deeper, and and how can you really commercialize this, and and we we're really at that point now where uh, with the airlines, with the airport, with the consumers that are wanting this as well, with regulators and governments, if you all make the the, the deserted push, we can make this really take off. Yeah, and we just need to have that additional incentive or that, that additional vision to, to, to really have SAF and some of these other fuels start coming into the marketplace now. So I, I think the, the transformation has been from, hey, um, how, how do we do this in a simple way? How do we scale it up? How do we make it more complex? How do we get more actors on board? So it's been a real um, amazing journey so far. Yeah, that's great. So, so I, I'm going to come to Jennifer. Feel free to take this. Although it came from Jimmy, you know, it seems a little uh, inside. No, no. Feel free to answer that. But 
But I also want to kind of bring us back to um, the kind of the government side, because I think Lands Attack has a has a, um, you know, a really good record there. And I want you to maybe comment on the government's role in picking winners and losers and and what that what a level playing field looks like. And, and so this kind of gets us back to that, that kind of government government policy piece and what the role of government is. And I think you've got a, I'm sure it's a, 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 a front row view of what that looks like. Yeah, that's a setup because you and I have talked about that. So I'll share I'll share a little bit of, of the things you and I have, have chatted about. You know, it's really important that we realize that disruptive technology is super important in creating the change that we need to create. And disruptive technology is not something that we can think about legislating today. So if the market, I'm sorry, if, if the governments put incentives or legislation that incentivizes by technology rather than by outcome, what it will do is it will literally slow down the new ideas. All that does is favor incumbents. And so we're missing out. And this is something actually Lanza Tech went through, right? We, we did gas fermentation, industrial waste gases that were going to go out as CO2 and converting those to ethanol. Was that bio or wasn't that bio? And bio gets an incentive. So do we get an incentive or not? And so I really think legislation has to be technology neutral. It has to be based solely on outcomes. And that is how we will create the next wave of technologies. And as all of the speakers have said, quite frankly, what we need is every solution to have a seat at the table. Any solution that can contribute should have a role to play. The market will eventually decide. They'll eventually pick the winners and losers. The government should not. Yeah, no, that, that's great. Um, well, we've got three minutes left. I think we're still, if there's more questions that come in, we'll, we'll gladly take those. But in this time, maybe uh, coming back to, to you, Scott, if you could tell us just uh, a bit more about what's what we might see in the future from United. I mean, you all have made some pretty, um, you know, amazing progress here over the years. And, um, you know, I, I think you gave a little bit of mention about your, your um, air capture uh, technology, air carbon capture technology that you're employing, yeah. but just kind of give us some kind of concluding thoughts on what you see, and then we'll go down the list here of other folks as well and, and ask a similar question. Well, it's been great being on the panel, uh, and uh, and Jerry and Jennifer, I'm going to have some follow-ups for you, um, so I'll look forward to that. Uh, but, you know, I, I think what you'll see at United is a real commitment, um, where I, I told people that when the Wall Street Journal, when I retire someday, and hopefully they write a good article about me, um, I hope that the number one thing that they say, I believe actually the number one thing that they will say about my career was the announcement we made back in December for 100% green. Um, because it's the starting point, you know, it's, it's a pebble today, uh, but can become an avalanche. Um, and I already said this once, but it's the starting point that can get the ball rolling. And, you know, what is unique at United is, you know, we have a broader platform um, than many people. Um, I can talk to a lot of people in DC, um, you know, I can talk to any reporter um, and we can talk about this and start changing the conversation. And so we're going to continue to invest in um, sustainable aviation fuels, support the development of sustainable aviation fuels, uh, but support even broader efforts to address carbon across the whole um, climate and the whole economy. Um, and we're going to be focused on doing the right thing, not what's good for marketing. Uh, we could spend a lot less money and get the same marketing bang for our buck in the short term. Um, then we're spending on direct air capture, for example. But we're going to focus on doing the right thing and hope that that leadership role gets others to follow. Um, and that's what I'll truly be proud of if we, if we actually help start a revolution. That's great. Very inspiring. So, Mark, how about 20 seconds? We're down to our last minute. Uh, any, any last thoughts, Mark? Yes, thank you very much, uh, Noah. We don't have to have the, the last uh, uh, sentence, but uh, I'm very happy to, to see this commitment in the U.S. on the sustainable aviation fuel. And of course, we, we want to support this uh, with the certification of aircraft to fly in the U.S. for sustainable aviation fuel to be innovative and to support, I hope, this transition to decarbonized aviation in the U.S. And it's very, very uh, encouraging to see such uh, big airlines as uh, 
the, 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 the US Airlines mm -hmm. and, and, and these very innovative producers of sustainable aviation fuels to work together to deliver solutions for, for the future of aviation. Great, thank you. Thoughts, we're down to 10 seconds. We are committed to continuing to invest in sustainable aviation fuel and helping the airlines fly more sustainably. Great. Well, uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Jennifer. I think we'll, we'll go with your, your previous comments as your concluding ones. We're kind of out of time here, but I just want to thank everybody. Uh, thank the the panelists, as I think I've referred to them before. They're really titans in their industry. The the, the thought leaders. Um, I am th so thoroughly impressed with with each and every one of you. What you do. Um, and, uh, and, and it gives us, I think, all confidence that decarboniz decarbonizing the aviation sector is within our grasp. I know it's not going to be easy, big challenges ahead, uh, but I think, um, you know, with the, 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 with the people that are on this uh, panel, uh, it gives me hope, gives me confidence that we're going to get there. So thank you all. Thank you all to the virtual audience as well. Randy Bell, I believe, is on here, and I'm going to turn it over to my friend Randy. Thank you, Jennifer, Jeremy, Scott, Mark, and Tom. Really appreciate this conversation. Really important discussion about a challenge that we have the opportunity to address right now. Um, one of the, the key themes of the Global Energy Agenda report that we launched this morning was that we need to realize the opportunities created by COVID-19 to make the energy system more sustainable. Aviation is a key opportunity, and I hope the Atlantic Council continue to work with all of our colleagues, uh, those on the panel and elsewhere working on this issue, to make progress this year. A couple of things that, that I heard, uh, a call for a, a carbon tax, um, really focused on being technology neutral, looking for outcomes, not winners, not picking winners. Uh, I think across the board in the energy system, that's an, an important point that we're focused on uh, emissions reduction, not picking uh, one technology winner over another. Um, that's going to be the fastest way to get there. Um, so really, and I thank Jennifer for making that point in particular. Um, that was the end of our first block of programming for the 2021.